want to tell my story quickly about what was influential for me to become committed to this work. And my story actually is probably different than most people's in the room because I got really, really, really interested in this work when I was 24 years old and in graduate school and developed a social and emotional learning curriculum, a social problem solving skills curriculum. It was so good for me, so beneficial for me, and I saw it benefiting teachers and kids, and I got so excited about that. And now I, I will confess I'm about to be 62, so this has been 38 years that I have been wildly interested and fanatical in social and emotional learning with a strong feeling that it's never too late, that it, it's also probably never too early. But I have a confidence almost prenatally through, through for as long as we're around and maybe beyond that these are important capacities uh, and competencies to enhance. I, another association I had is why, why with limited time, uh, what got me so excited about coming here uh, to make a presentation today? And I, I like to come at that in, from a couple of different directions. Uh, first of all, the fact that there's a three-year initiative in this work that is supported makes a big, big deal to me because I know that one-shot deals don't work. So when I hear about a three-year commitment, I think it's extraordinary and it's important and it's an opportunity. And the things that you'll be doing three years from now are gonna be so much more developed than what exists now because you have that long-term commitment. The other thing is uh, great people have to lead this work in a variety of ways. And I've had great respect for Dale Blythe for more years than you can know, um, but for a really long time. Uh, and also some of the other people sitting around the table, people who you'll hear from today, uh, whether um, it's Dean Freeman and we went out to, and had a great uh, breakfast this morning. We talked about faith and the importance of faith and the role in faith in helping us to achieve and covered all kinds of uh, different topics. Uh, Terence Kwame Ross, uh, who runs a, one of the best middle school SEL programs in the country is here, and, and Jean Roque Partain from Search Institute. Uh, you know, these are people who I've known, I've respected uh, for, for so many years. And then Jane Eastwood I just met at the table, and we're already old friends scheming about how to transform this kind of work in after school programming, during school programming in St. Paul, across Minnesota, and across the United States. So we have big visions and big things that we can accomplish. So it's always fun to connect with people. Um, and I should also say that I um, love Minnesota. Uh, it happened very early on uh, with interest in the Twins and the Vikings growing up and uh, also with many of the politicians here, uh, whether it's Hubert Humphrey or whether it's Gene McCarthy and, and others over the years. And, but it was interesting because when Gene uh, when Dale mentioned uh, we live on the shoulders of giants, there are three Minnesota giants who aren't with us anymore, and I just wanted to say uh, who they are briefly and the impact they had on me. One is a guy named Norm Garmisey. Uh, Norm was a professor of psychology at the University of Minnesota who um, taught me and uh, the world more about issues of resilience and competence. And he started really uh, doing a great deal of work in the area of people with schizophrenia, but evolved to recognize the importance of prevention and uh, just an extraordinary uh, person and scholar. The second is Peter Benson. Uh, who I know many of you know, uh, 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 what a leader of out-of-school programming, but also the, uh, an advocate for youth in the highest possible way when he's talking about sparks and about assets, and he's so influenced how we think positively about children and youth and what they're capable of doing and contributing. And then finally, my closest collaborator uh, was born in Minnesota, Mary Adney O'Brien, who passed away about uh, two years ago from breast cancer. Mary and I worked uh, for 15 years together. Uh, so uh, I can tell you if she were here, 
she'd be co-presenting this with me today. And I think in many ways, uh, whether it's the influence of Norm Garmisey or Peter Benson or um, Mariette Neil O'Brien, all great Minnesotans, is that, uh, you know, they're, they're all uh, with us in, in a variety of, of ways. Now, there's new innovative ways to do surveys, and then there are old ways to do surveys. And I, so um, it was great to see and get the data that you, uh, you covered today. I just want to say a couple things about those data, if I can find them. Um, I think SEL, the most important thing about SEL is healthy relationships, so I was very happy to see that um, be up there. Uh, when it came to can this stuff be taught, and most people think it can be taught, there are, uh, were 22% in the room who I think said, well, maybe. Uh, one of the messages I want to give is this stuff definitely, social and emotional skills can definitely be taught. And there's 30 years of research really to document that that's the case. Um, when it came to who do I think most people in the country think are doing this work, um, what did I answer? I answered parents and families. Um, because I think that's the case. On the other hand, it was great to see the distribution because some people believe that if this is really to work, it's going to be in schools, it's going to be in out-of-school programs, it's going to be with families, and the answer is obviously, and they don't let us do this, all of the above. And one of my messages is going to be how to connect and have things be um, all of the above. So the old-fashioned surveys that I want to do, though, just to get me oriented a little bit more in terms of getting to know you, and we can do this, probably not with the online audience, um, at least I won't see the online audience, but we could do it here. How many of you have been to the Castle webpage? And if you have been, okay, great. Looks about half, but it's not as accurate as the, there were, uh, 232 respondents in the room, and I think it was 115 who said yes to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, how about, how many of you have been to the George Lucas Educational Foundation webpage, the ed Edutopia? Okay, so fewer there. And so one thing I can be very helpful with is to say to people, well, go to both of those webpages because they both have a lot of resources, a lot of ways uh, that uh, can benefit and influence work. And I'll show one video from uh, the Edutopia webpage in a while today. Um, so you can see, whenever I give a talk, I get distracted. I want to respond to the things that have just happened. And, and it's part of wanting to be a lifelong, continuous learner. And it's not an accident that I run something called the Collaborative. To, for academic, social, and emotional learning. Everything we do with CASEL, we're not a center, we're a collaborative, and we try and think broadly, and a lot of this is through interaction with others, uh, learning from others, working with others, and, and by style, inevitably when I come to give a talk, I focus on the thing that I'm most preoccupied by, okay, in the week before the talk. And here's what I'm, most preoccupied by. Some of you, and I'm going to read this, um, I, I'm preoccupied by the shooting in Sparks uh, Middle School in uh, Reno, Nevada. Um, and I'm preoccupied by that for a few reasons. One is you'll hear a little bit, maybe too little bit, about Castle's Collaborating Districts Initiative. And Washoe County, which is a fantastic school system, uh, is a castle collaborating district, and this shooting occurred uh, in, the, in that district. Uh, and so this says, uh, uh, teacher was a hero in Sparks Middle School strategy, and I'm gonna read this one and, and the next one. Yeah, this was on, if you go to the Washout County webpage, you'll see this uh, on their webpage. I, I took it off of there. It says, Michael Lansbury, a Sparks Middle School math teacher, was killed during yesterday's shooting at the school. Lansbury is being remembered by school district and community leaders as a hero following yesterday's tragic events. Police say Lansbury calmly approached the student gunman in an effort to protect other students, saving many innocent lives with his heroism. And I think that's what he did, my understanding, as he walked towards the student with his hands up, uh, tried to create calm, there are other students there who had cell phones who were calling 911, 
and the police responded very quickly to the situation. Uh, and the fact that they did, I think, saved uh, many, many lives. Uh, and he uh, is a hero uh, in many, many ways. And uh, the sad and tragic thing is he was a veteran who came back from Afghanistan. So if you can think about having gone through wars there and then to come back and be shot on a playground um, is incredibly uh, overwhelming and uh, powerful. Uh, I think, to experience. Then the other thing, and this came from uh, Michael Lansbury's teaching website for the kids, um, where he said, you are asking yourself what annoys me. It depends on any given day. Just like you, I have good days and bad days. A very good skill to learn is reading people and their moods. One of my goals is to earn respect while you earn mine. I believe with mutual respect, that the classroom environment will run smoothly. Well, what a powerful message. And, you know, he obviously, the things that people are saying, he was a good guy. And the way he worked with kids seems, and I, don't, I didn't know him personally, and just picking up things and being influenced uh, powerfully by his messages. I'll say something else, and this is just quickly about the castle. Uh, collaborating districts. One of the things we do with our collaborating districts work is we have two consultants who are SEL consultants to the district. One a former superintendent who knows about change management processes at the district level. The other really somebody with great expertise in SEL. And when this happened, we uh, immediately, the two SEL consultants went to the district and have been uh, uh, working with the district in a variety of ways. I could spend the whole time up here just talking about the work that they did out there. I'll say two things, three things. They gave people in the district a chance to share their worries, their concerns, their anxieties in a variety of facilitated meetings. And they also gave people a chance to identify and recognize certain acts of heroism, certain acts of caring, certain positive things that people had done. And they just allowed and created the space for this to happen, which I think was enormously powerful for uh, the students, the, the educators in, in, uh, in Washoe County. The other thing, and I spoke to one of our consultants on Sunday before coming here, I said, tell me, what was the most powerful thing that, you know, the less, a lesson you learned from doing this work? And he said something that was really, uh, I think, important. He said that within the schools, when this happens, they go into a mode of action. They try and figure out how to take care of things and they don't really have time to think about people's feelings and uh, their worries and their concerns or to acknowledge the importance of relationships because they're so busy doing. And one of the things he said is people that he talked to were incredibly appreciative from the notes, the calls that they got from people in the community from around the country to just say we're there with you, we want to be supportive. And I think one of the most important things, and I've worked in schools for a long time now, uh, being a teacher, being a principal, being a superintendent, it is very tough work and they need support. And don't underestimate the power when you can share something positive and caring and supportive to them that that has. And I think that that's part of social and emotional learning, the relationships, the connections that can happen. So um, I have to be careful. Marianne and O'Brien used to say that sometimes I would give a talk and I'd spend the whole time on the first slide. And, and so I, I'm going to start moving ahead uh, a, a bit. But I want to, uh, if we can, I do want to show at least a bit of a video. Um, and Michael Lansbury was a math teacher. Uh, uh, this is about math as a social activity. I wanted to show SEL um, as how it's done when uh, math instruction is integrated with social and emotional development. So let's, let's just watch a little of this. And again, it would be great to, we won't be able to debrief, but I wanted to share the experience and also excite you because GLEF has a 
you know, many, many social and emotional learning uh, videos on, on their website that you could see and learn from. Chris Oso is a master teacher at Bowman Elementary School in Anchorage, Alaska. He views math as a social activity and believes taking time to impart the skills required for cooperative learning can lead to calmer classrooms and more rigorous studies. Why is private think time important before we have our discussions? Um, Sadie, what are you thinking? This fifth grade math class was recorded during the first month of the school year. At the beginning of the year, establish a set of working agreements, but I provide four categories. I provided speaking, listening, thinking, and, your, and behavior. And that's really social emotional learning. And then we did an exercise where the kids thought about and kind of imagined a great classroom, like the, the best place where they could possibly be learning. And what would that look like in each of those categories? And so we, we took all of those ideas and we developed what's called our working agreement. Um, and then kids look at that consistently and set goals from that, and then they rate themselves. Um, you know, today I did a great job, and they provide an explanation and evidence of, of the rating in terms of those goals. Um, also, we do a lot of discussion, and, and that's another area. Kids did the same thing. They worked together and, and thought of what a great discussion is. It, it wasn't kids raising their hands. It was kids bouncing ideas off each other. I, I personally believe when, when kids ha have some say in making those rules and those routines and those working agreements, um, they're going to own them more. So I'm going to give you your first model. We're probably going to go around a real fishbowl where we stand around the outside and we're going to watch and really think about a, what a good discussion looks like, how we talk and how we listen, how we ask questions, all of those good things that you guys do very, very well. So here's your first model. Please honor the private think time. Let me read it with you. Mike has eight dollars. Kelly has twice as much as Mike. Do you know what that word twice as much means? Hey Riley, could you and Laura work together as a team on this one? Would that be okay with you? Sure. Okay. So Mike has eight dollars. Is this Mike? Yeah. Okay, so he's in any classroom. Anywhere you go, you're going to have an incredibly broad range of, of kids, socially, academically, all across the spectrum. And so how does a single person, as a teacher, as a manager, teach you know, 20 to 30 kids in a single classroom when that, that ability range is so wide? Um, I personally believe that the social skills and, and, more importantly, students building social skills to help them work together, to talk about math, to explain their thinking, to offer help when, when another student is struggling. And, and just as importantly for that a child to be able to accept help, that's a really difficult part of that equation. All of those skills are part of the social arena that we're working in. And without them, I don't know how you could teach a classroom with such a broad range of abilities. How do you want to make this model? Kids' ideas matter. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your idea. When we pay attention to their ideas, not necessarily saying that's a good idea or that's a bad idea, but we say thank you for your idea. They're more willing to share it. They probably care a little bit more. It probably feels a little bit safer to share that idea. Because no matter what I say or try to push, unless the kids own it, it's not going to matter. I took your ideas about discussions, what makes a really great discussion, and I wrote them on the board for today. And so when we go to Fishbowl, we're going to choose a team like we do. We're going to go around and we're going to make these observations. And your job as an audience is to listen very closely to see if every voice is heard at that table. I want you to listen for thoughtful questions and look for this evidence. You ready? Okay. Remember, give them space. Give them, Give them space, space. and if you're, if you're in front, in front what can you do to let everybody, let everybody see? see. see. Audience, Audience, our voices, our voices are, off. are off. We're just, we're gonna, just gonna look, look for, for evidence of a really great, great discussion, and then we're gonna talk, talk about that afterwards. afterwards. I began using the fishbowl, fish having kids, kids really closely, closely observe other, other kids, kids in discussion, in discussion identifying, identifying particular types, types of language, ways to ask questions, how to use manners when disagreeing, 
um, how to choose, how to choose as simply as how to choose to, who speaks first. I'll start. <laughs> In a fifth and sixth grade classroom, we, we wouldn't expect that, but boy, it can derail a classroom instantly if they don't have those basic skills. And once that foundation is built, then, then the academics can be so much more thoughtful, so much more intense, um, and that's what we're shooting for. Mike started, started with, with eight. eight. Kelly, Kelly had twice, twice as much as Mike, as Mike. And, and Joe, Joe had half, half as much as Kelly. Kelly. Every, Every teacher out there has probably said at some point in time, turn to your neighbor and talk about this idea. Look at your teammates and talk about this idea. Actually, I, I'm not quite getting... Why did you do those shapes? Because I look cool. And really watch. If they are talking about the topic that you've asked them to talk about, if they're actually listening to each other and using that language and those social skills, then all of a sudden you have an environment where 30 kids are all learning at the same time. How would you get Three, even if you did the half of eight, that's four. <laughs> Is that five? I don't know how I got three. It's not going to happen at the beginning of the year. But in my opinion, the efficiencies that you'll gain later um, by far outweigh the time that you spend at the beginning teaching those basics. Kaylee, I was standing behind you and I kept hearing a lot of questions coming your way. How did that make you feel? I don't know. I mean, you know that sometimes when people ask me a lot of questions fast in a row, I get kind of nervous. You know what I mean? And I can't, my thoughts, I kind of lose my own thinking. Does that happen to anybody else when somebody says, hey, Riley, hey, Riley, did you, what's, what's the answer? So, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you get a little nervous, but that's all right. That's part of our learning. And so I want you to feel comfortable with that. That's okay to feel that way. Right now, right we're going to have, have the observers are going to discuss a little bit and make some comments. Some comments. Audience, what, what are some, what are some things, things that you okay, know? Maybe we could okay. stop the tape at this point. Point. Um, um, my, main my main goal, goal is, uh, is actually, uh, actually to interest you in going to the GLEF webpage. They have many, many good videos, including this one. This is just an example uh, that I think is important. Again, we're the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. There are all kinds of ways to teach SEL skills, some through uh, direct instruction, but a lot of the work being done now is through integration with academic instruction, and it's very important. One of our big emphases is this isn't an add-on. This is uh, a way of, I think, doing business broadly, whether it's during school, after school, uh, in, in a lot of ways, and this teacher, who's a great teacher, is, is uh, in Anchorage, Alaska, another one of our collaborating districts. So what I'm going to do now, uh, with apologies from the outset, I've been in this field now for 38 years. I teach a course in social and emotional learning. It's a 15-week course, uh, and so what I'm going to do is take you on a journey which is a high-level journey, I think, in a way, with just a smattering of ideas, so you get a sense of how the work is unfolding really nationally, and if you end up having enough interest in certain elements, which I'm only going an inch deep into, there's a lot of follow-up and backup for these things. So I, I, I want to go through, and I'm going to basically summarize things and uh, Kate and I work to develop some of this work. One of the things, because I don't know if people have PowerPoints uh, for this, but I share everything, okay? Castle shares everything. So if you look at this and say, oh, we'd like this, um, this is probably a dangerous thing to say, but the field of SEL, I hope you understand me correctly, is based on sharing and stealing. Okay, so just uh, if, if you want some of this PowerPoint, we'll try and figure out a way to have it arranged so people can get it. We can actually, we'll put a bit, the video and the slides up on our website after. Okay, great. So, my thing's not advancing, so I'm going to look up there a little bit with this until it starts to. Uh, so, I discovered my question in 1976. I went to an APA conference. I heard my advisor say, there are too many kids who have problems. 
There are never going to be enough professional resources to help these kids. What we should do is figure out how the start, from the start, we promote competence in kids. We help them be their best through working with schools and families and communities. And literally, I heard his presentation and I said, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So this is the only professional question I have cared about since 1976 is how do schools and families and communities work together to support positive outcomes in kids. Uh, I'm going to tell you everything I learned in one slide. <laughs> the first thing is kids do better when they have uh, support and, uh, uh, and if you can strengthen family functioning and if they have sustained positive relationships with caring adults. Kids do better when they're provided with high quality education and when kids are connected to their schools and feel positively about the educational experience, they're going to be more successful. If communities are safe and supportive for children, that's good. And if you have high quality out of school programs, it's positive. And then the only thing that I add to that, which is a little bit of a wrinkle from um, the Castle perspective is you need to provide children and youth with opportunities to build their social and emotional competencies. So if you're doing things on the family and adult level and mentor level, if you're doing things to improve quality education, if you do things to have kids engage and be excited about learning, if you do quality after school work and you're concentrating on their s social, emotional, and cognitive, uh, moral, and physical development, that, that, that's that's what we need. That's the roadmap. Okay, so that's that's based on a lot of science, not just my science, but uh, uh, many people in the field. Uh, if you look, and again, I don't want to make this about a bunch of statistics in different ways, but uh, uh, these are mostly from the Center for Disease Control, and uh, one of the things that happens, we look and we see negative outcomes in kids, and it leads to a war, a war on violence, a war on bullying. Uh, but you can imagine, and if you think about the situation I showed from Sparks Middle School, as soon as there are fights, as soon as you think people are carrying weapons, as soon as you see the bullying, it's hard to learn in school. And these things really have to be addressed, but not necessarily through categorical approaches, because if you go on and look at other things, you know, you uh, kids, drink too much, or there, there are many who are depressed and attempt suicide, or there are people who engage in high-risk sexual behavior, and you can't have a war about each of these things. And finally, and this is uh, from work of other people, Connell and Clem among others, uh, 40 to 60 percent of uh, high school students, they say, are chronically disengaged from school. So one way to look at this, and it's been the way that I think dominates most government uh, initiatives is uh, there's a high profile thing that happens, there's an agenda that gets advanced, and there's prevention of one negative categorical outcome, and it leads to fragmentation. Uh, I was always influenced a lot by the Search Institute and, um, I, and um, some of the surveys that they did, and this is from one of the national surveys, where they ask kids to comment on, on, for people who know you, how many look at, would rate you on thinking through the results uh, of, of your choices, or caring about others' feelings, or respecting the values and beliefs of others, and, and uh, or even asking the question, my school provides a caring, encouraging environment. And for all of these, the kids, less than, fewer than 50% of the kids acknowledge this is who they are. So you can think about what problems do we want to prevent, but you can also think about what competencies do we want to encourage and what kind of environments do we want to create and how do we get kids to understand that there is caring because it's one thing, and we've done surveys on this too, kids don't perceive as much caring as the adults feel they're trying to convey. So how do you bridge that divide as part of the work? And we think in certain ways that an emphasis on social and emotional learning can help. So when we work with any community, when uh, the work that we've done over the years uh, with any school, we always start basically with two sets of questions. Uh, what do we want our children to be, to know, and to be able to do when they graduate? And how can the entire community be organized to ensure that students reach those stated goals? And that's the interest. And very often, when you find out what 
people's highest dreams are for their kids, what they want them to develop, or if you look what the business community wants. Uh, you could go on, a lot of things that get identified are social and emotional competencies. So we have advanced work in this area and we were influenced by um, initially four questions. Uh, the first one, are people with better social and emotional skills more likely to succeed in school and life? I can tell you there's probably thousands of correlational studies that show if you're socially and emotionally competent, you do better in school, you do better in work, you do better with your families, and so on and so forth. The key question, and this is what there's 30 years of research that talks about, is can social and emotional skills be taught? And now uh, we have to catch up with the research that shows that they can be taught, how they can be taught, with the best practice that demonstrates this every day, and have people understand that this is the case. Uh, a next question is, will teachers, uh, will students, uh, children be better prepared um, for college and careers if we teach these competence? Will they be more successful as adults? And I, I'm just gonna say something from the perspective of a college professor, which I've been for 33 years. The kids who have problems in my classes are not the ones who struggle academically. The ones who have problems are the ones who disappear. The ones who don't know how to self-advocate, who don't know how to express a challenge or a problem that they have, who, who don't know how to use a TA for support or helping services and things like that. These are all social and emotional competencies that again, a lot of kids come to college and you'll hear the news, oh, they're not reading at the right level, they're not doing math at the right level. Well, some of these social and emotional competencies can help them to navigate systems so that they can get the help and support they need and at the same time there's the support from the environment that has to be conveyed. And then finally uh, a big question that we've been involved with is how can we ensure that educators and families and uh, uh, you know um, community organizations and the like teach these skills well. So that's what we have been focused on. Uh, Castle and there's a long Castle story we've been around for 20 years at this point it was developed in 1994. Dan Goleman was writing a book on emotional intelligence and said it was a different way of being smart and it could be taught and schools should do it in evidence-based ways and there should be an organization devoted to promoting these competencies. We were a little concerned. We didn't like the term emotional, competent, uh, uh, emotional intelligence. We think some people have a misperception about intelligence that it's fixed rather than malleable. Uh, there's a lot of research now from Carol Dweck and others that says that intelligent, you actually get smarter. We believe we get smarter every day. Um, and, uh, so, and we thought there was a social dimension and we thought it was important to emphasize learning. Uh, we thought it was important to build all this work from a social development perspective, an emotional development perspective, from a cognitive development perspective. So as we thought about this, we said, okay, we want to emphasize, schools are focused on cognitive, we want to emphasize social and emotional dimensions of development and learning, and we want to emphasize that these things can be learned. So social and emotional learning, the history of it, uh, and we wrote the first book in 1997, an ASCD book called Promoting Social and Emotional Learning Guidelines for Educators that ASCD sent out to 100,000 educators. And like all of a sudden there was a field, and this was a term, why is there confusion a bit about social and emotional learning? One person's perspective is because we made up the term, okay? And I mean, maybe some other people used it, but we tried to use it, we tried to develop it, we tried to popularize it at Castle. And, and it has gone beyond our wildest dreams, the interest in the work at this point. And when there's great interest, there are a lot of people who come on, who do things in all kinds of ways. And the question is, can we provide any kind of structures, um, definitions, frameworks, and things like that so people can look at what they're doing, which is very often addressing people's social and emotional development, and is there a way to create structure so people look at it and say, wait, this is what I do, and seeing it this way can help me even do the work better in some ways. That's what we're trying to accomplish um, with, with the efforts. So CASEL has focused on uh, social and emotional learning research on expanding evidence-based SEL practice throughout the country. Our mission really is to have SEL be in every preschool through high school in the United States right now, and we work a lot on federal and state policies, so we're, 
we're a collaborator, we're a convener, we try and bring people together to uh, work to advance this work. Um, if you said, what do we really want in our heart of hearts? How do we envision this work? It's, um, we want educators and students and families and researchers and community members to come together to support the healthy development of students. We want students who are engaged learners, who are self-aware, who, who can self they're self-disciplined, they're caring, they're responsible de decision makers. We have certain outcomes that we want for students. And then finally, we want students who are contributing in positive ways to their schools and communities. So if you think about this, the model here really is, how do all the members of the community come together? What are the outcomes they're trying to achieve? And how do we, as an important outcome, recognize that students, that kids, what they met, feel, what they, what they think matters a lot, and they can make things a lot better. We have a, this is a core belief that Castle has. Um, I mentioned the book. This is in 1997 when we wrote the ASCD book. Uh, we defined social and emotional learning at that point as a process through which children and adults uh, learn to recognize and manage emotions, demonstrate caring and concern for others, um, uh, develop positive relationships, make good decisions, and behave ethically, responsibly, and respectfully. So this was the broad general definition. We have focused a lot on five competencies. Self-awareness and self-management, social awareness and relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. When we came up with this idea, we thought it was clever and we thought it was gonna be unifying for the field. Because we said, okay, so what do you need to know? You need to know yourself, you need to manage yourself, you need to have empathy or concern or compassion and understand others, you need to have good relationship skills. And when you make decisions, and if they're responsible decisions, you want to make them about yourself or about relationships with others. So we thought we kind of had it here. Oh, okay, so these five competencies can help to guide work and people can look at this and even ask simple questions. What are we doing to promote somebody's self-awareness? What are we doing so that they become better self-managers, a bit more persistent, uh, uh, more self-disciplined? What are we doing to promote their social awareness? What are we doing to make them better at relating and having healthier relationships with others and to be good active agents who make good decisions and contribute? So that was kind of the umbrella model that I think has been helpful in a variety of ways for people to think about this work. Uh, and we, we've tried to change it over time. We bring together groups, we reevaluate, but so far we really haven't, at least for us, found a better framework uh, around which to organize some of these things. Uh, so the basic model that we work with, again, is how do you get schools and families and communities coordinated in their programming how do you make social and emotional learning a core part of the work? And part of the reason schools have been interested in this is because of increasing research that if you have kids who are socially and emotionally skilled, they not only have better relationships, but they do better academically. And I'll share brief data about that. But to tell you the truth, this is only part of what we're interested in. When we think about the outcomes, we think about what it means to educate somebody who's going to be healthy, who's going to have good social relationships, and who are going to be engaged citizens. So there might be battles that people have about what's the goal of education, what kind of outcomes do we want to produce. But our big argument, I think in some ways, is we want kids to be academically successful, but we care about these other dimensions of development as well. And we think that schools and families and communities can work together to achieve this with many more kids and many more positive ways. Uh, how do I bring excitement to a meta-analysis is one of the questions. Well, you, um, uh, so here I'm going to give you data from a meta-analysis. It took us five years to carry out. Castle likes to say we, carry, we do things that nobody else would be willing to do. So in this meta-analysis uh, we said, well, the field is developing. Let's look at all the research that exists in universal school-based programs that addresses kids' social and emotional development. And this has been published in a journal uh, called Child Development. I'll tell you, it was one of the most painful experiences of our, li our lives. We, uh, I want you to have empathy about this research article. Uh, you know, the, we, they had five reviewers. We went through multiple revisions. But it, this is a very important study, 
I think, that we've developed that has looked at SEL, and here's the basic data. When programs are doing a good job on creating positive, nurturing learning environments, when they teach kids social and emotional competencies, uh, kids develop better social and emotional skills. They have more positive attitudes about themselves, about schools. Uh, they have more pro-social behavior. They have fewer conduct problems. They have um, less emotional distress. And one of the things we found, and we didn't expect it going into the study necessarily, was that there was an 11 percentile point increase in academic achievement test score performance, just focusing on the kids' social and emotional development. And this has been a powerful finding that has really, I think, perked up interest in schools around the country, in the U.S. Department of Education, where we're working actively with them on things, and uh, to have interest in this work and saying, yeah, schools should be part of the groups that do this and advance this work. Uh, there are longitudinal studies. We're in the midst of another meta-analysis right now looking at the longitudinal studies, but there's programs like the Seattle Social Development Program that looked at social and emotional competence promotion, family engagement for kids, uh, in uh, first through fifth grade, they actually now are following them up to 30. And it's been a longitudinal study, but there are long-term benefits of multi-year interventions, and also there is a new type of work that we're involved with. It's too much to get into right now, but we're very interested in cost-benefit analysis and making an economic case for the importance of this work. Uh, we looked and asked the question, is SEL more effective, more consistently, when it's conducted by school staff or outside uh, people. And I think that this is an important message that I don't want to have be confused. When teachers, when school staffs do this work, the data in our analyses showed greater impact, more consistently. It's not to say that we shouldn't have collaborative work, that people from uh, outside agencies and the like shouldn't be in and involved with the partnership, but it's not surprising, if you think about it, that a teacher who's with the kids every single day, if they learn, if they're engaged, that this stuff doesn't just happen at certain times in the day, it happens throughout the days, and there's more power when somebody has the mastery, not just what I'm doing in the classroom, but wh what are we doing as a school throughout the day? The other thing is that the quality of implementation really matters, okay? So if you have a great program and it's poorly designed uh, and it's poorly implemented, the results aren't as positive. And that's something important to think about because that means we need good professional development, we need good support, we can't just do all of this with mirrors. Uh, one of the things that people have looked at is the impact. This has to be a twofer, and it's something to think about in your own work as well. We, of course, want kids to have better outcomes. We also want people who are implementing these programs to have better outcomes for them, to feel more positively that doing this is not just good for me, it's good, good for the kids, it's good for me. So some studies increasingly, and this is one from a long time ago, talked about um, I become a better problem solver in my own life. I communicate better with students. I deal better with stress in my own life. This is from a, an array of sixth and ninth grade teachers who implemented SEL. So think about that in terms of the work you're providing. If you're saying, when I do this, it's good for kids, but I also know it's good for me, you have to have that twofer, okay? And if we design programs that are not good for the implementers, or if implementers have jobs where they're not feeling nurtured, supported, and their competencies are increasing, it's going to be time limited in a lot of ways. Um, we do principal training, emotional intelligence groups and things like that, and a lot of times principals say, hey, this has been good for me, I have recaptured my vision of what education should be, and also I've learned I have to, to make this work in my schools, I have to learn a little bit about systems transformation as well as personal transformation in the work. Uh, we've also done meta-analyses of after-school programs, and I will just say quickly in one of the readings uh, that's on the web page, we'll talk about this, but when you look at out-of-school time, out-of-school programming that focuses on social development is beneficial for students, but it's not as beneficial as it could be, okay? And not all programs are created equally. So one of the things that we've f focused on in analysis of these programs is do the programs have some kind of sequential 
programming to develop kids' competencies? Are there clear places where kids are actively involved practicing and using the skills in daily life? Is there a focus on social and emotional development that is really highlighted? And are we specific about what skills we want kids to develop? Uh, better problem solving skills, better decision making skills. How do we want to approach this? And the bottom line is when we looked across all the out of school programs focusing on social and emotional development, if they had these safe features in the programs, they produced benefits. If they didn't have the features, um, they, they didn't have positive impact on kids. So it's something to think about. And again, this is a model it's only worth thinking about as you do your work. Uh, is there a sequence? Is there active involvement with the kids? Are they more focused? Are you clear on what skills you really want them to develop? The more that's the case, I think the stronger the impact will be. Um, so what's the impact of all this on, on our thinking? Uh, we think that there's a lot of research now that shows that SEL works and produces positive outcomes across grades in urban, suburban, rural schools. It can be, uh, it's doable. Uh, and this is something from the school-based perspective. Uh, and, but SEL needs support. It needs federal and state support. It needs leadership. It needs good professional development because implementation really matters. Um, so what, what, with all this stuff, in 2010, Castle got together, and I'm just going to go through this quickly to highlight a few things. We came together and we said, okay, so now we want to support a national initiative in social and emotional learning. We want this evidence-based work in every preschool through high school in, in the country. We want it in every classroom. We want it in every school. We want it in every community. How do we go about accomplishing that? And we've worked with the Novo Foundation on basically six areas, six initiatives, six strategies. On the one hand, we're working with collaborating districts because uh, we're trying to think about large urban districts. How do you do this systemically? Uh, we're trying to create tools, um, whether they be district toolkits, school toolkits, uh, program guides, assessments toolkits. How do we create tools that are how-to guides about how to accelerate this kind of work to other districts nationwide. Um, we focus on state standards and guidelines and federal policies. Uh, I don't know about the numbering on this. Uh, we, we focus on numbers, uh, you know. But um, uh, we partner with all kinds of people to advance the work, and we're working on strategic communications in this area. Uh, we work in our district work right now with Anchorage, Alaska, Austin, Texas, Cleveland, Chicago, Nashville, Oakland, Sacramento, and Washoe County are our collaborating districts. We're in about the second year of hopefully a multi-year demonstration project with these districts, and the goal is to have this be in every school across the districts over the next couple of years with a rollout. Um, when we think about the work and what it requires, there's work in the classroom, there's work with school climate, there's work with school family partnerships, there's work with uh, coordinating with mental health and health services, and there's the importance of after school and community activities. So our model when we're working with districts is saying, how do all these elements come together with synergy, with coordination? Uh, we're being, uh, this is being externally evaluated by the American Institutes for Research, where they look at the implementation practices, influence on climate, on competencies, on student behaviors, and on academic performance. It's a multi-site, multi-year study that we're in the midst of trying to figure out if it works, how does it work? And um, it's better to have somebody from the outside do that kind of work. Uh, we're working on a school kit. How do school teams work together to advance SEL? Uh, we think, again, the message is it should be everywhere, uh, not just in the classroom, but in every aspect of school. Uh, we work on guides, and we're trying to identify um, well-designed programs. That some involve, as I said earlier, explicit skills training. Some talk about new strategies for instruction. Some focus on how to integrate SEL with curriculum. 
Uh, and when we pick a program, and there are many out there that are CASEL Select programs, we say, are the programs well designed? Are they well evaluated? Do they have good professional development to support implementation? We have completed our preschool and elementary school guide. We're in the middle of a middle and high school guide right now. We have not done an after school program guide uh, in terms of the work that we do, but that's something that I think could be enormously helpful if it happened. Uh, again, when we do this stuff, CASEL doesn't have our own programs. We try and create standards for the field, we uh, frameworks, criteria, and we rate people programs on these efforts uh, to make sure they're doing things well. Uh, we've worked a lot on state policy. Illinois, we worked with in 2005, they were the first state in the country to develop preschool through high school social and emotional learning standards. Uh, around these learning goals, there are 10 development standards. We have developmentally based benchmarks. We have performance descriptors at every grade level. The work in Illinois has excited other states around the country, other, indeed other countries. Singapore has standards. Uh, Kansas just developed social and emotional and character development standards. Uh, it, uh, Pennsylvania has pr uh, pr interpersonal development standards as well. We're doing right now a scan of all 50 states. Interestingly enough, all 50 states at the preschool level have social and emotional development standards. 40 out of the 50 states actually call them social and emotional development standards. Others call them things like personal and social development. But I think this is important to emphasize. K to 12, there's mainly an academic focus, although there are places across all the states there are some freestanding standards that are developing, some being integrated with Common Core, some being integrated with health education and the like, and we're just trying to take things that are the missing piece that are hidden and make them more explicit where they appear and give people options for how they might develop policies and programming to emphasize social and emotional development and work to be done. There's federal policy. There is the Academic Social and Emotional Learning Act of H.R. 1875. Call uh, Congressman Klein and tell him you want support. Actually, uh, this has been introduced over the years in a bipartisan way, and there, uh, there's some bipartisan support, but we need a lot of sponsors. The more people are supportive of this work, uh, then it's going to get into ESEA reauthorization, assuming that No Child Left Behind will be reauthorized at some point. And we also do a lot of work with the U.S. Department of Education. You're going to see social and emotional learning, social and emotional development, and more initiatives, like in Race to the Top and other things that they're advancing. It's being included in the legislation. So future priorities for CASEL, where we're going, we're collaborating with the eight large districts and other socio-demographically uh, diverse districts. We're uh, uh, evaluating the CDI and creating tools at this point. We're identifying the best evidence-based programs that are school-based at this point. We're working on a whole thing on SEL assessments. Uh, we work on state and federal policies, and we work on communications. There is a big communications problem with people talking about the same thing but using different language, I think, very often. So in conclusion, um, here are some of the core beliefs we have. The first one is that relationships are the foundation for learning. People learn from who they care from, care about. If they, if you, I'll learn from you if I think you care about me and I care about you is part of the message. Emotions affect how and what we learn. Uh, Emotion drives attention, and attention drives learning. This is required by employers more and more, and Castle's going to start to make a much stronger connection at this point to the business community. The business community may call this soft skills. They may call it 21st century skills. But one of the things that's clear is technical and academic competence might get you a job, but what keeps you the, the job is social and emotional competence. What gets you advanced in many jobs is having these competencies, and we're hearing that more and more from the business community. And finally, the skills can be taught, and the question is how to do it and how to do it well. Uh, so I'll leave you with just two take-home messages. The first uh, came a long time ago from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, where he said, we can not always build the future for our youth, but we can build the youth for our future. Uh, one of the things is, 
Who knows what the world's going to be like five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now. Who knows what education is going to be about. We need to educate kids who can be lifelong learners, who are responsive, who can function societally, globally, as effectively as possible. And part of building the youth is an emphasis on social and emotional competence. And then I'd like to say why I've been involved in this work for so long, um, and with an emphasis on education systems. Uh, you know, Nelson Mandela's quotation, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. I truly believe that. Education, though, happens in schools, it happens in families, it happens in the community. So how we all work together to establish the most powerful, best education for our students, it will be beneficial for them, and it's going to be beneficial for our communities, indeed beneficial for the world.